Good morning and welcome to Christ Episcopal Church. It's Sunday, October 2nd, the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi, and we're so happy that you joined us. If you'd like, you can join us at one o'clock today for the blessing of the animals under the tent at 20 Carroll Street. We also want to let you know that last week we installed the Reverend Dr. John Cater as our Rector Emeritus. There's a special message from Bishop Shen that you'll hear later in the service. If you'd like to follow along with this morning's service, you can go to our website at ChristChurchPOK.org, and there you can download this morning's bulletin and follow along with the service at home. If you'd like to make a donation to the ongoing work of Christ Episcopal Church, you can go to tithely.com and make a safe, secure online pledge. Or you can send a check to our physical location at 20 Carroll Street, Poughkeepsie, New York, 12601. Thanks again for joining us, and may God bless you this week. And may you find ways to share the wonder and joy of that blessing with others. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than either we desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. How lonely sits the city that was once full of people. How like the widow she has become, she that was great among nations. She that was princess among the provinces has become a vassal. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has no one to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile with suffering and hands of servitude. She lives now among the nations and finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Sion mount, for no one comes to the festivals. All her gates are desolate. Her priests groan. Her young girls grieve. Her lot is bitter. Her foes have become the masters. Her enemies prosper because the Lord has made her suffer for the multitudes of her transgressions. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. From the daughter Sion has departed. All her majesty, her princes, have become like stags. They find no pasture. They fled without struggle before their pursuers. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. By the waters of Babylon, we sat down and wept. When we remembered you, O Zion, as for our harps, we hung them up on the trees in the midst of the land. For those who led us away captive asked us for a song, and our oppressors call for mirth. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song upon an alien soil? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my rigid hand forget its skill. Let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember the day of Jerusalem, O Lord, against the people of Edom, who said, down with it, down with it, even to the ground, O daughters of Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy the one way pays you back for what you have done for us. Happy shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. <clears throat> May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, but a new creation is everything. As for those who will follow this rule, peace be upon them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one make trouble for me for I carry the marks of Jesus branded on my body. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. 
glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. By 1226, Francis had lived and died. He left behind a community of brothers numbering the hundreds that he never intended to start and a revolution that he had not foreseen. The impact of his life was so great that 800 years later, I and others like me, followers of this unintended revolution, will stand before groups of people like yourselves to tell his story again as we celebrate his life this week. Francis was born into the rising merchant class in Assisi in Italy. His father was a cloth merchant who had made his wealth through business rather than owning land or having a title. You could say that his father had pulled himself up by his bootstraps, and his father believed it was so. Francis grew up as the son of a self-made rich man. He was a partier and a mischief maker who loved wine, women, and song. He was also a young man who had dreams of being a knight, of victory in battle and fair maidens rescued. At that time, the only way to be a knight was to gain recognition on the battlefield. Using his father's wealth, he bought the horse, the armor, the weapons, everything you need to look the part of a knight, and found a knight to take him into battle. But it didn't go well at all. Francis was captured and spent quite a period of time locked up as a prisoner of war. When he finally returned, he was sickly, and that sickness would affect him the rest of his life. With his return, he began to feel a stirring, something reaching out to him. Unlike many stories of the saints, Francis's conversion to the faith is not instant like St. Paul, or his faith wasn't ever present from his birth like St. Therese. It was gradual, through different events and baby step conversions. One day, Francis was wandering a little outside the city and came across an old crumbling church. Francis went inside and sat in the silence. On the wall at the front of the church hung a large painted cross. As Francis began to pray, he heard a voice from the cross say, Rebuild my church. A simple statement, really, at least on the surface. But it was a statement that would change the life of Francis forever. Today's gospel says that at that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. I can imagine those gathered around Jesus listening to these words. I can imagine the learned men and those who considered themselves intelligent to begin to wonder what it was that had been hidden from them. Suddenly a new puzzle emerges for them to solve. What was God hidden from us and why? But what, but what will boggle their mind more is to realize that if God has hidden something from them, God hid it right out in the open, right in front of their noses. 
What I mean is that we are so geared to knowing more and more, looking at the systems, the ways of thinking and being, so geared to the complexity of it all that we somehow miss the obvious, the simple, the mundane. Take the words of the cross spoken to Francis, rebuild my church. My initial response to that statement would be about reform, about looking at the church and what needs to be done, fixed, expanded, grieved, buried, birthed. To me, it's about change in all of its abstract, undefined ways. It is easier, even safer, to jump to these large, abstract notions sometimes because it makes them too big for us, comfortably out of reach. Who am I to rebuild the church? Who am I to change the way things are? What do I know about liturgy or canonical law? Perhaps in what we would call an infantile response, when Francis heard rebuild my church, he took that literally. You see, Francis wasn't concerned with the how or the when or with building permits or zoning laws, permissions or status quo. Francis heard from God and he was going to do it. And in reality, perhaps he should have been more concerned with the systems and details necessary. Because Francis went straight out, sold some of his father's cloth, and took the money to the priest to help rebuild the tiny church. His father had money, and Francis was going to spend it like he always had. Only instead of on wine and parties, he would spend it on rebuilding an old crumbling church. The priest, not wanting to get involved in a family matter, refused the money. But that didn't stop Francis. He took the money and gave it to the poor, and then he set to plan B. Francis had been told to rebuild the church, so he was going to do it. It was his task. So Francis took to the streets and began to beg for rocks. The late Anthony Bourdain said that once you have ruined your reputation, you can live freely. Here was Francis, a man who was part of the rising merchant class, had wealth and status, and was now begging for rocks because a talking cross told him to. He started to live at the church while he worked and live off the generosity of the people. He began to get to know the poor and others begging for their bread. And you better believe that people noticed. They began to whisper and point, isn't that Francis, the life of the party? What's he doing begging for rocks? He began to talk to people about his work, and some people laughed, but others helped. Things began to stir. Francis, following the simple words of the cross, started to affect the community and his family. And he was ecstatic. His father, however, was not so excited. He found out that Francis had sold a large amount of cloth for the rebuilding of the church and was not happy about it. In the middle of the square with the bishop and all the townspeople present, his father demanded the money back. Francis, having given it to the poor, tells his father he can have everything that belongs to his father. So Francis strips naked in the square, handing his clothing back to his father and tells him that he owes nothing more. All Francis heard was the simple phrase to rebuild my church. But this is how revolutions start. Small changes which lead to a bigger changes, which catch the attention of others who start their own small changes until everything looks different. For example, let's look at the statement, feed the hungry. Now, most of us, when we ask to feed those who are hungry, it is common to find organizations that help individuals with food and to donate to them and volunteer with them. And that is good. Keep doing that. But what happens if we also take the simpler, more direct approach? What if we were brave enough to feed someone who's hungry, to physically get food and place it in the hands of those who need it? How does that change the interaction? And how are we changed by the experience? What am I being invited into by serving someone food rather than only writing a check? 
Both are good and both invite us to engage in different ways. Francis chose the direct route and it changed him, his relationship to the world. And then his change inspired others for the last 800 years. His choices influenced my choices. And it all started with begging for rocks. As Francis stepped more and more into loving those around him, he stepped further and further into the place of uncertainty and mystery. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light, the gospel says. Nowhere is it explicit what we are learning from God or what we will ask, what we will be asked to do. There is very little certainty about the process, only the outcome. There will be rest for our souls. Francis's yoke was to rebuild the church by loving and caring for those around him. And through his whole ministry, he was homeless, sick, hungry, poor, had hundreds of brothers following him around, and was abandoned by his own family and friends. By the world's standards, he was a complete madman and a disaster. But that madman was happy. He had taken up the yoke of God, and he had found rest for his soul, despite what everyone thought. This is the simplicity beyond complexity. When we can settle into the fact that not everything has to be big, sweeping legislative motions, but that there is power and meaning in the simple and small, anything is possible. Francis didn't set out to change the world. He set out to rebuild a church and through that work, learn to love the church, the people and the institution. And his love changed it forever. What started as words spoken from a large painted cross asking him to rebuild a crumbling church ended up in Francis actually reforming the institutional church by showing the church that sometimes the way people need to be loved is in practical and personal ways, by loving them in simple ways. And that through a million simple expressions of love, he can in fact change the world. On October 4th, we commemorate the life of Francis. The evening before, thousands of Franciscans around the world will gather in their communities to remember the life and death of Francis in a service called the Transitus. At the end of the service, we will hear the last words of Francis, which I'd like to share with you now. After gathering his brothers together, breaking bread and blessing them all, Francis looked at them and said, I have done my part. May Christ teach you yours. And with that, Francis laid down and died. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen. The prayers of the people. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for our bishops, Andy, Alan, and Mary, for Susan, our priest, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, especially our President Joseph, Volodymyr, the President of Ukraine, and the leaders of NATO, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, especially Betty, Peter, Julius, Eleanor, Walter, 
Diane, Joanne, Craig, Charles, Janice, Dennis, Jean, Mary, Jim, Kate, John, Jane, Matt, Chris, Roxy, Ron, David, Sarah, and for the people of Ukraine, the people of Russia, and for peace between them, that they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Heavenly Father, you have promised to hear what we ask in the name of your Son. Accept and fulfill our petitions, we pray, not as we ask in our ignorance, nor as we deserve in our sinfulness, but as you know and love us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace and all good to you. Hi, this is Alan Shen, Suffragan Bishop of New York, visiting this community, wonderful parish community, Christ Church in Poughkeepsie. And those of you online, welcome. And it's wonderful to have you join in the worship and good to meet you. Um, on Zoom in the virtual space. Blessings to you all.
the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.